Hi everyone, we're here with Professor Mukun Tatte, who has just won the Infosys Prize 2023 in Physical Sciences for his work on the emergence of complex cells. Hi Mukun, thank you so much for being with us today. It's lovely to have you here. Hi Sandhya, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm just going to ask you a series of bunch of, uh, you know, rapid questions. I was wondering if we could start off by you talking about your work, what you do and uh, how long you've been working in the field. Yeah, sure. So I am actually trained as a physicist, but I work at a place called the National Center for Biological Sciences, um, which uh, I think is quite representative of the fact that biology today is very much an interdisciplinary uh, effort. Um, starting with, you know, sophisticated experimental methods, um, all the way up to the kinds of new data analysis that you need to look at complex biological experiments. Um, so NCBS, where I work, is actually a place where a lot of uh, physicists have actually uh, uh, joined the faculty, and um, it's a place where we ask questions at this interdisciplinary interface. Now, my uh, specific question deals with the cell which is the fundamental unit of uh, all living things, as we're taught in the textbooks. Um, that itself is quite a surprising fact. Why can't there be other kinds of life that are not cellular? Now, when you look at the origin of a cell on Earth and the evolution of cells, there's, there's a few really big leaps that happen. The first is the very origin of life was pre-cellular. They were just molecules that may have undergone something like Darwinian evolution. But evolution really kicks in when you get cells which are able to store their own genetic material and therefore, um, in some sense, keep their own innovations to themselves and compete. Uh, so, so you can think of that as very much the start of proper Darwinian evolution. Um, and those cells are prokaryotic, what we today call uh, bacteria and another kind of group which we call archaea, which I'll bring up. Now, the second big leap in cellular complexity happens um, around 1.5 billion years ago when a new type of cell emerges on Earth, and these are called eukaryotes. And eukaryotes are the kinds of cells that make us up, and plants, for example, but there are also single-celled eukaryotes. There's many, many different kinds. So what I study is this transition from prokaryotic, which are small, um, architecturally simple cells, to these big, architecturally complex eukaryotic cells, um, leading from that time point billions of years ago all the way to the present day. And you've been uh, you've been at NCBS since 20, 2004, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Right. And since then, you've been studying how these cells evolve. That's really interesting. Could you please tell us a little bit about um, the specific aspect of your work that was recognized in this award? Yeah. So obviously, when you ask a big question like that, there are many ways to approach it. Um, so the approach that we take is we try and uh, reconstruct the history of cells by looking at their genomes. Uh, there are a lot of published genomes of eukaryotes, and so you can use statistical methods to push back in time to try and reconstruct what kinds of uh, molecules these cells encoded, what kinds of proteins in their genomes. But that's just half the story, right? Knowing uh, the protein sequence doesn't tell you how the cell actually functions. So what we do is we use um, uh, models and approaches from uh, physics and computer science to make dynamical models of cells. And we sort of feed in what we think the molecular repertoire was. And as an output of that, we get the, the physical configuration of the cell. Um, and the specific aspect I'm interested in, we use something called the membrane traffic system, which I'll explain in a minute, as a sort of window uh, into looking at the emergence of complexity. Um, and I'm happy to tell you more about the membrane traffic system, but uh, it may well be something which uh, requires too much jargon um, but but let me make an attempt at it if you think it's okay. Yes, please. Could you please simplify it as uh, for us? Yeah. So um, so prokaryotes are small. They're like one or two microns. A micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. Eukaryotes are much bigger, so they could be ten microns on each side. So a thousand times bigger in volume. Now the way molecules get around prokaryotic cells is they diffuse, but diffusion is very slow at larger length scales because it goes as the square root. So eukaryotes actually move stuff around in the cell using active process. Uh, just like you have things moving around a city uh, between different warehouses on, on trucks, right? So inside the eukaryotic cell, these warehouses, we call them organelles. They're sort of membrane-bounded compartments. And the trucks are smaller membrane-bounded little, um, little balls called vesicles. And what the vesicles do is they pick up cargo from one uh, compartment, and they move it to another, and they deposit it. Right? So that's the membrane traffic system. 
And it's really a wonderful uh, kind of test bed to look at complexity because um, the whole system is emergent. It's just the interactions between molecules and the specific nature of those interactions that somehow cascades up to give this much larger um, trafficking system or network. So um, that's where we come in. We, we use dynamical systems models and others to take these fundamental molecular processes and try and explain how they make these cell scale um, networks. And this is, uh, it's at these really tiny micro scales that physics also plays a role when it comes to movements of these organelles and other parts of the cell. Indeed. I mean, I think the most important lesson from physics, one of the most important lessons from physics in the 20th century is the role of noise or hmm. unpredictability or uncertainty. Um, so in, in fact, Brownian motion is a, is a, is a facet of noise. Uh, Einstein was the one who figured that out. Uh, but noise or unpredictability comes across many areas of physics, including chaos theory. Um, so what physics tells you is that at that scale, the, the dynamics are not fully controllable. So it's, it's, uh, it's actually an amazing thing that a cell can take such noisy uh, building blocks and still build something so reliable. I mean, there's an, another thing that happens, right? If you imagine how cells make animals, that's another place where you get this very reliable output from smaller processes. So I'm doing the same thing, but inside a cell. Got it. Uh, could you please tell us now what the application of your work is? What is the next 10 years looking for, um, for the field of research that you're in? And how are your findings going to be applied in the real world? Yeah, so when I first got interested in this problem um, was around 2010. Um, when I first joined NCBS, I was a physicist looking for problems, you know, but uh, then you meet a lot of colleagues and they get you excited about too many things. And then you have to decide what you're interested in. So I, I narrowed down on this membrane traffic system. But um, at that time, the, the idea of looking at eukaryotic evolution was uh, uh, was sort of not so widespread, uh, not least because we didn't have that much data about eukaryotic diversity. So that field didn't even have a name. Um, at that time, right now, there's a name for this field. It's called evolutionary cell biology, and we, you know, uh, my colleagues across the world and I have had, uh, you know, a lot of fun building a community to actually ask these questions, right? And it's really quite an exciting uh, community. Uh, so I think it's important for people to realize that evolutionary cell biology is a field, and that uh, it's a field that requires effort from engineers and computer scientists and physicists as well as biologists. So I think that's one of our major contributions to really bring visibility to a question, which otherwise seems very, very difficult to articulate. Um, it's not to say that has, this hasn't been studied. Of course, uh, the 1970s saw a huge uh, spike in uh, interest in the origins of eukaryotes and people like Carl Woese or Lynn Margulis made enormous contributions at that time. But I think now it's at totally different scale because you can test a lot of these ideas. And, and not just that, people are finding new organisms in the deep ocean that have implications for what's going on. So what I'm trying to say is that a lot of this is very fundamental. It really goes to the question of who we are and, and where we came from, um, because eukaryotic cells somehow, uh, without that leap, you would not have had further innovations um, at, uh, at higher structures, for example, multicellularity. Um, applications, well, of course, uh, you can imagine lots of specific applications if you understand membrane traffic. So, for example, viruses hijack the membrane traffic system in order to replicate. Um, a lot of the molecules that are built in cells rely on the membrane traffic system working correctly. So some of the models we build may, in other people's hands, have some, um, have some implications for looking at such processes. But uh, we don't specifically work on the applications. One thing I will say, though, is that um, if you look at the number of eukaryotic genomes that are being sequenced now, you know, we've, we've crossed 1,000 completely different types of species. Um, there's going to be a lot of data. And you can't think about biological data without thinking about evolution. Because evolution gives you the principled framework in which to organize that. So I think the more people who start to use evolution as a framework in their work, whether they're cell biologists or biotechnologists or physicists for that matter, um, the more we can extract meaning from those data. And I think that will be the true long-term application of bringing evolution back into the center of biology. That sounds wonderful. It also feels very promising. You know, when we were in school, we learn about the cell and the small components of the cell. And we think those are the smallest things that we can ever study. And then the tech keeps growing where you can study the mechanisms of how these small objects inside our cells move as well. 
and it sounds really promising your work looks extremely exciting as well is there anything else that you would like to um uh, mention to our audiences and our viewers about your work and in general about uh, the cell that is interesting well um if i could take a slightly more philosophical view i think hmm. uh, we're in a in a sort of paradoxical time where science and the products of science are more powerful than ever uh, and yet sort of people's general skepticism of science is increasing um and and there are there are reasons for this right um in the sense that uh, now science actually goes out and touches people um and people have to make decisions every day based on scientific fact um so it's fair enough that people lay people uh, should ask what is the basis for the uh, claims that scientists are making if we don't fill that gap and explain what the basis is for the claims we're making uh, i think we leave open a space for misrepresentations of science uh, and this can have obvious long term negative consequences for for society right so um i think it's not only fun to talk to people and get excited and explain your work but also just to explain that science is in fact based on uncertainty um it's absolutely core to science and we we can never have a full working knowledge of any complex system uh, and yet it's the best we have and so how to balance uh, these two things and make informed decisions um is something that uh, people should uh, engage on and i think scientists have some role in that discussion absolutely and we are seeing that uh, become more and more crucial especially since covid the importance of science communication and health communication as well mm -hmm. on that note thank you so much mukund i think we can wrap up our interview it was a pleasure having you here and all the very best for your future work as well thank you very much sandeep